Hey folks, Eden Grow Creedmoor here, coming to you from the outside of my main garden, back there. It's beautiful, and you know what? I can smell corn is in the air. Y'all like to grow corn? This isn't corn, this is banana. We're fixing to grow some corn. Right there. Mm-hmm. It's too late though. A lot of you folks are gonna say, wait a second. It's way too late for you to set up a car garden now, Creedmoor, and uh, and put up an effective stand of corn. Nah, that's hogwash. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And what I wanna do is I wanna make a video on me making a bed just of corn. I understand corn's a grass. So I'm going to stick it over here in the middle of all this Bermuda grass. Yeah. Right there where the red clay is. Mm-hmm. Creeping Chuck, Charlie, and Jenny. Yeah, all three of them are over there, too. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. So this is the preview. You want to see how we do this? Stick around. Or simply follow me back to Eden. And I'll show you what I got going on. The banana's not bad. I wish I could grow them here. So this plastic has been down for, I guess, about a week and a half. It's time to pull it up. Y'all can probably tell by looking at the top of the plastic. This area does a fairly good job of hanging on to moisture, but the elevation is about three feet above the next tier. And that elevation is about six feet above the next tier down. Way back yonder, we used to put a garden over there, and because of all of what washes downhill, the gardens were always really, really rich. Today, I like to produce the stuff closer to the home, which is up that way, not that way, so here we are. So these are kind of nasty now, and if I were to fold them up as is, they'll be nasty later when I unfold them. I used to rinse them off, it doesn't seem to matter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separate them from the ground, place them over there and cover them up with some weight so the wind doesn't blow them away. Later on I'll take them up onto the slope somewhere else and rinse them off. They can be reused over and over again until the plastic can't hold itself together anymore. I like to get rid of them before that because you can end up with an ugly mess where the plastic is all broken up into a million pieces. And then you need a rake to pick it up and it's not worth it. Plastic in the ground long term doesn't work that well. So here's the how it looks. probably thinking, holy cow, what has Creedmoor done? It looks greener today than it did the day you put the plastic on. Of course it does, because I put a greenhouse on top. Now this stuff is super, super vigorous, right? It's superficial, I promise. The first little bit of cover that's going to go down is going to pretty much eliminate all of that vigor. Watch how we do that. Okay, folks. So here you can see that I put down cardboard. I put about two, maybe just better than two layers of heavy cardboard down and I spared y'all the uh, torture of watching me peel all of the plastic off because there was plenty of tape on it. In my garden cart over there I've got a nice little ball of tape that came off of the boxes. I'd rather remove it than have it come swimming to the top in the middle of this garden later on in the season or even after that. 
Um, while you can do that and it's not that big of a deal, it is kind of important to get the plastic out of there. We don't want microplastics in our food. Eventually the soil biome will break them down, split them up, sever them into billions of little pieces. At that point in time they'll be called microplastics and they could potentially be taken up into the roots or um, into the plants. So we really don't want that. Uh, hopefully that answers any questions about whether or not I leave the tape. Um, I want to say that also added to this stuff that I have going on here on my opposite side, I've got a two gallon container of plant exudates that I've removed from quite a bit of decaying plant matter that I take out of my main garden and then I recycle those plant exudates back into place so that I can feed the microbiome that's in place. So we're going to be conditioning the compost that we put down. The first layer is just to my left to your right. There's a pile of compost that's been there for about two years. The compost doesn't really resemble its parent media anymore. There isn't really that many wood chips in it. They're very, very small if they are there. Um, and basically everything else has been broken up and fractionalized. And I normally don't add this stuff to uh, other uh, food growing plots, but I'm gonna use it today because I think it accurately reflects what a lot of you may have, which is compost with some seeds. Um, and I can comment on the seed content because I know it's there. My wife, uh, she, well, before this year, she used to kind of enjoy putting uh, whatever leftover uh, fruit scraps that we had in my compost pile with that all of the seeds that they contained also went in there so every spring I would have lots of volunteers growing over there. That pile is no different and um, while I said before normally it won't be entered into my food systems I'm going to enter it here because I do ultimately believe that it represents what a lot of you folks have. So um, on top of that I'm going to put this two and a half or three year old pile of chips that we mentioned earlier in the video. That's going to go over the top of that. Um, that's really a chip compost. It's not really chips anymore. There's plenty of hummus in there. I've already looked at it under the glass and there's lots of uh, microbiology and all kinds of living things in there. But it's going to go into this mix too, right on top of the really, really composted soil that I have. So I'm going to go ahead and click back. I'm going to use red to do a lot of this stuff. And I'm gonna drag the water hose over here first and wet down the cardboard thoroughly, giving it a little bit of weight to it, um, adding some moisture to it, encouraging the worms and everything else. You know, yeah, the ants and all of the other soil dwellers to come up and start breaking it down. As that green Bermuda grass that you saw under there begins to struggle, it will start to senesce. And as it senesces, rather than being able to regenerate its life because it has access to light, um, it's gonna start to die off and those uh, dead and decaying portions of the roots will be consumed by the biologicals within the soil and our hope is that they will do a sufficient enough job to prevent the regrowth of those grasses. Um, if they don't, we'll go to a remediation posture later on, but at this point I'm not going to really worry about it because we're going to put so much nutrients above that layer that it's going to allow the corn to grow all the way and uh, we should get a rather nice crop of corn later on in the growing season. So. All right, so here we go. I'm going for the hose. I'm gonna get some water, and then we're gonna fire up red, and we're gonna start moving some soil. So hang on. <laughs> okay. So for those of you who do happen to have a tractor, this is about where I'd start using it. If you don't have a tractor, use your wheelbarrow, use the cart, use a rug, use a carpet, use a tarp, use whatever you can to move your resources from point A to point B. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to go ahead and use the tractor just because it's convenient, it's available, and unfortunately I'm by myself. I couldn't secure help today, um, but that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a tractor, y'all will see, I'm going to put the bulk of the pile right in the middle and then I'll go to it and then I'll use my shovel and my rake to spread it out as far as I can. After it's been spread out, I'm going to go ahead and put the pile of wood chip compost right on top of that and we'll spread that out. We're not going to mix the two together, we're going to leave them separate, one layer then the next layer. But, I make mention of one tiny little thing. That pile's been sitting over there uncovered. I'm fairly certain lots of nitrogen was washed away from it. The rain's washed away. Nitrogen's water soluble. Most of it is anyway, unless it's contained within the confines of the bacteriology that's in the soil. So be that as it may, even they can wash away. So I'm going to go ahead and lay that down, spread it out nice and neat. Y'all will see. 
And I'm going to put a few amends on top of it. In particular, what I'm going to do is I'm put some chicken manure on it. It is a commercial-based chicken manure that I bought because I had to do that at the time. Didn't have the luxury of taking from my two chicken neighbors. Um, I'll show you that in another video. But in, in any event, what we're going to do is we're going to apply that to the top at a rate of about 5 pounds per 100 square feet. I'm going to use about 10 pounds. And that should be more than enough to get me into range of growing lots of things. But more importantly, what it's going to do is it's going to start the process of bringing in the fertility that I hope to have. The combination of the local born soil biome mixed with the chicken manure, mixed with other amends. I intend to put some calcium uh, rich um, eggshells that I've crushed and been saving down on top of that. And then I'm going to go right over the top of that with the wood chips to my right. So after we get a good enough build of our bed, I'm hoping somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe neighborhood of maybe four to six, maybe eight inches. We'll reassess, we'll water in it really well, and then what I may end up doing is putting on top of that some aged one-year-old wood chips to prevent any of the wind-blown seeds that are all over here in my field from blowing in and then re-germinating in such fertile soil. So uh, we don't want that to happen because I don't want to add competition. I'm already probably going to have some tomato plants popping up in there, but you know we'll make use of them. Um, my goal was to grow the corn and also to grow something for the bees. Pretty cool idea, right? All right, here we go. Kind of hoping that y'all can see this. Plenty of minerals plenty of organic material in here and uh, I'm sure if I had to assess this out it's probably upwards of about 15 percent um, and now it's going in the garden.
you know, a lot of folks don't have access to this much compost. That's not been lost on me. Start out small. I start out with none 11 years ago, and now I have more than enough for my needs. So what you're seeing here can only happen because I had the foresight to put these things together, to gather the resources, and to continuously do so. Now if I need to make an extra garden or two, I still can. Um, I ended up with a little bit more than I thought I would need. <laughs> That's okay, the plants won't argue about it. I don't particularly care if it's perfect. It doesn't have to be. At this point, I have between four and maybe seven inches of um, top covering above the cardboard. That top covering consists of the previous waste from my growing areas, all food plants. Um, there's no bad mojo in it. It does not even resemble the dirt or the clay that I'm standing on because it's been so well amended with uh, natural organic items. Now the next pile that goes on top, this is the real money maker because there's still a lot of living stuff in there. The biome hasn't given up on it because there's plenty to eat. The first thing I'm going to do is run over there and I'm going to grab some of these amends and I'm going to go ahead and spread them out. I've got some coffee grinds. Y'all go ahead and use your coffee grinds. Spread them out over the top of your soil. What else might you have? Eggshells? That's what we're doing here. We're going to drop some eggshells too. And I'm also going to go ahead and put the layer of the bag chicken manure on it. Um, I know that one scoop is about two pounds of my little scooper. So I'm going to do that probably um, about five or six times. Um, and that should get me about where I want to be. I am going to blanket amend this. This is a first time plot. We all saw it boring here today. So I am going to go ahead and blanket amend it. I'm going to use this calcium from the eggshells. I'm going to use the uh, potential for there being a little bit of nitrogen, some other things in the coffee grinds, and maybe some other biologicals as well because it's been sitting around a while. And definitely there'll be biologicals in the chicken manure because it's no longer sanitary. It's been open and held in one of my greenhouses now for probably four or five months. So let's go ahead and make this happen. Y'all need to see this. Okay, so here's an example. Well, camera's shaking. Here's an example of what we're growing over the top of. That's the red clay. So for those of you that are clay bearers, forget about this. Maybe after you do all the things that I'm suggesting you do, you might be able to grow in this. Probably won't look like that anymore. But we don't care. I'm going to turn the camera around and show you what we're putting on. I'm going to stand here and talk about that. So there on the left of the new garden plot, y'all can see from left to right, two-gallon sprayer. That's got my plant exudates in it. They were extracted over the course of the past week. We had a little bit of rain. I had a lot of composting remains, so they were collected. And I put about a gallon and a half in there, and the rest is water. I want a high concentration of this because I'm getting ready to put it down on top of everything else. You can see the uh, chicken manure that I'm going to spread and the little tiny blue scooper that I'm going to use. And we're going to probably use all of what's in that bag. And then there's some eggshells and some coffee grinds. All right? 
for those of you that might experience issues with uh, inhaling dusty, uh, contaminated things, I would recommend that you put your mask on and wear that. It's not particularly busy right now, so I'm going to do this while I hold my breath. <laughs> but once I go ahead and get all these things down, I'm going to take the two-gallon pressure sprayer and essentially wash it all in. And then I'll take red and I'm going to put the next layer right on top. Wind of it, it's not so bad. Go ahead and scratch it in. mixed in there. Um, in all honesty, I believe that the soil organisms are going to mix this stuff in much better than I can. I'm going to get on this edge over here, give you all an idea about the depth of this. You can still see some, there's some big woody matter in there. I think I grabbed some of the pile behind it. So there we are, and the grasses. So maybe it's panned out to about six inches. That's the tripod over there, wood chips. Now we're gonna go over here. There's my two gallons of exudates we're about to spray on there. And afterwards we'll be putting these chips on top and the banana peel is going somewhere else. Really fortunate to have a really, really nice calm day today. All right, so same situation as before, folks. This is full of bacteria, it's full of other things. You don't want to be, there's the wind in my face. You don't want to spray into the wind. You want to spray on the other side of the wind. It's good advice.
Okay, now y'all may be wondering why Crazy Creedmoor is spraying this bacterial rich plant exudate solution on his brand new garden. At one time, that compost was more fungal rich than it is bacterial rich when it was in the wood chip state and when it had plants growing in it. It shifted to bacterial dominant when I put it in the pile and stopped putting wood chips and things like that in it. It lived out the last three years in that pile. Now I've got a three-year-old pile of solely wood chips, highly fungal dominant. I know it's not highly bacterial dominant because it's not super hot and because much of it's broken down so that form of metabolism has slowed and I'm going to attempt to marry the two together. We're going to marry that with that. The two will eventually amalgamize both chemically and biologically. They'll become one and the same and it'll be fertile from the earth all the way to the sun. In order to combat the weeds that could blow in, we're going to put some less fertile wood chips on top. But in the meantime, we're going to get this covered. We're going to get it looking good. We're going to get it watered in. And you know what? It's still too early for me to plant um, corn. I'm going to wait till a couple of weeks after the last frost. Well, I absolutely know there's no chance of me getting a cold snap. You know, North Carolina is kind of funny. We have some cold snaps in some pretty weird parts of the year. So I'm going to hedge my bets, and I'm going to give it a little bit of time to marry and rest. In any event, whenever I feed my plots, if I believe that they're low in uh, nutrients and minerals, I'll always do it a few weeks before, a couple, two, maybe th one or two, maybe three weeks, depending on which plot it is and what I'm doing, before I actually sow. So yes, um, this is not outside of the realm of what is already normal. Okay, But in this particular plot, we're going to get the soil food web to become the dominant precursor to delivering nutrients to the plant. Even though I have put some nitrogen and some phosphorus and some potassium and some calcium and some other things in there, and even though I've done all of that, it's up to the soil microbes to marry that in, to start breaking it down, to start engorging themselves, and then for the predatory um, uh, microbiologicals to start freeing that stuff to the plants. So it's an entire web of what's going on here, and uh, that's the best way to describe it. So um, here we go. Without further ado, we're going to put some wood chip compost on top. Y'all ready? Pretty well broken down. Full of worms, full of all kinds of stuff. Okay, back to manual labor.
Okay, so there's the lay, the initial lay. Grass cut short, cardboard laid thick, compost laid thick, composted wood chips laid thick, and if I want to, I can go ahead and install another layer of chips on top. At this point, I'm not going to. I'm going to let it marry in. Probably even plant some plants. I'm going to get it looking good. But more importantly, I'm going to pack the edges all the way around with the heels of my boot. I'm going to give it one more raking, and then I'm going to leave it alone. That's it. This will produce whatever I want it to. It really will. Y'all will see. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, we're essentially done. This project is completed. What? It's not. No. They're telling me it's not completed. There's no plan. They're telling me that nobody knows what to do next. Okay, Creedmoor, you made a plot, now what? You could put some seeds in it and grow them. I got another couple of weeks before frost is gone, so I won't. Um, if you have concerns with whether or not there's enough soil in there, there is, for me, because I'm going to use seeds that already grew over there. You guys are going to use some seeds you bought from the store. I would suggest possibly using plant starts or putting some seed seeding media that's specifically for germinating seeds into small cup size holes within this. And you could plant to your heart's content because by the time those plants, seeds become plants, the plants will have no problem taking sustenance from what you see here today. Um, not much more can be said about that. Uh, pretty much everybody that enters the Eden Way knows that early on you're going to have to use some form of surrogate soil. I take my surrogate soil from existing garden beds. We've talked about that before. In this case, I just used a rather large batch. So I know I can grow in this. I have a little bit more left over there I could sift and screen. Anyone who has a pile of chips sitting around for a while has surrogate soil. Sift it, screen it through a quarter inch mesh, you'll have plenty of soil to drop your seeds into. Do you need to feed it? Not necessarily. Seeds will grow right in that. Is it better to feed it? I like to give it a tiny, tiny little bit of food so when it wakes up, produces its second and third stage of leaves, it's not like, hey, Creedmoor, I'm hungry. And then I gotta go feed it. Um, 
in any event, that's not really an issue here. Um, if you have any concerns, you think that maybe something you might have might have some pathogens or it might have some uh, herbicides or something that's going to be uh, resistive to colonization of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and all the other things that are good in there. You know, we want nematodes in there. They're going to show up later after everything's really tuned in. Um, so if you do have something that's suspect, here's my best advice. Don't add it. Don't put it in there. If you don't put it in there, you don't have to mitigate it later. Wood chips don't come with weeds. They don't come with weed seed. They just come with wood, cellulose, carbon. It's all going to break down. I promise it will. If it doesn't, well, it will. Um, but if it doesn't, you can always inoculate with fungi. You can always inoculate with bacteria, just like I've done. You saw me in training it. You saw me adding this sort of like this little catalyst to it. Um, just so you know, when I use this catalyst and coat the seeds that I'm planting in here, they already have some protections afforded to them by those uh, bacteria that are in the teas to coat those seeds and protect those seeds. And then the seeds grow and then they continue to colonize on the plant. Um, mycorrhizal rhizomes are similar too. They have lots of relationships with many of the plants. And we're even finding as time goes by, we knew about 80% of the plant life accepting them for symbiosis. As it turns out, there are just other kinds that handle the other 20%. Any event, y'all know you're pretty well covered. You need to do a pH test. I will. Then what? Amend if necessary. What will I amend? I'll amend only the soil around the plant. Because the soil organisms are going to mediate all of that stuff in time. It hasn't even seen a season married together yet, right? It's been what? 15 minutes? <laughs> it only gets better from here. So, the next video is going to have me planting. And then I'll do a video of the plants growing, and then we'll do a video of me managing the plants, and then we'll do a video of me harvesting the plants. Um, if you're familiar with growing corn, you know that it's very, very hungry for grass. It likes a lot of N, T, N, K. So that's one of the reasons why I built it really deep, because I want a lot of biology to be able to facilitate that for it. The flowers that I put in there for the bees, they won't take a whole lot. Many of them will be accumulators anyway, and they're going to draw in from the from the atmosphere around them as well as in the soil. So always get a good idea what your game plan is going to be ahead of time and format everything to that end. Uh, in this case, I built this bed deep enough to hold my corn. It's facing the western winds that are going to come from the northwest and blow over here. Um, corn needs wind to pollinate. It needs several rows in this particular case. I'll probably put somewhere between four and eight rows here. That way I know that there's going to be enough of um, the corn and the pollen to blow around in there and at the face the face of the prevailing winds I know that it's going to do a pretty thorough job of, uh, of pollinating for me. I will have to treat the ears with some mineral oil and do a couple of other things um, but my biggest goal early on is going to be to raise the bricks, raise the bricks of all the green leafy foliage that comes up with these things with these plants and hopefully hopefully my hopes are I can only say I can hope I can hope I can hope I can pray um, that the insects will go somewhere else. Um, we're just going to have to wait and see, right? Really, enjoy this, because it's really, really cool. And if you learned a little something, if you picked up a little tidbit or a golden nugget here at the end, click the like, click the subscribe, come back.